Well, Kira, thanks so much for taking some time to hang with me today. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, I'm very interested in first hearing the story of how you got into being a coach and specifically around this whole idea of being a spiritual entrepreneur. Like, tell me, tell me the backstory. Well, <laughs> that's a long backstory. Let's let's find the best parts. Um, I will say I began my road of healing. Uh, I don't know, probably over a decade ago, where I started to jump in and learning healing modalities, and I had this beautiful healing um, practice where I had lots of people coming in. It was really amazing. And but there was this this little thing inside that always told me. <sighs> they can do this on their own. And if they do this on their own, then they don't have to show up every week at my house. And then I'm not their fixer. And so it led me into this inquiry of how do I, how do I help women start to learn how to heal themselves? Now, in the middle of that inquiry, I had my own, what I'm going to call an awakening, which was just pure hell (laughs) as they Mm -hmm. most likely are just all of this childhood trauma that I'd never really dealt with. A lot of childhood sexual abuse was in my life. I thought I had dealt with it, but I hadn't, I had not faced the pain and the pain rail. It just rolled in like a wave Mm -hmm. and it, it pulled me into a place where being in a human body in a world with so much pain seemed like the last thing I wanted to do. And so I almost took my life. And in that moment, when I didn't, I felt as though God was saying, there is a reason for you to be here. And so out of this pure, like need to surrender, I said, from this moment on, I'll do whatever God needs me to do. And that's going to help me stay here. And that shifted not only my whole life in every single way, but it allowed me to then create what I now do, which was really jumping into the realm of coaching and helping women awaken their own ability to heal. And then that led into awakening their ability to be leaders. And so lots and lots and lots of pain involved in this experience, but it was worth every ounce of that pain because of the life I live now. Mm, That's so beautiful. Um, As you were opening up to kind of this healing journey, what were the things that sparked that for you? Like what was it, was the, the arrival of pain into your life or the awareness of pain, or was it a teacher that you came across or was it, you know what I mean? What were, what kind of awakened that within you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was actually that someone I loved came to me and told me they had been sexually abused. And it was interesting my whole life. It was like, I was very aware of my abuse memories. It wasn't like they'd never been there, but it was this belief like, well, I can go through that pain. I'm really strong. And I went through it, but then like to know somebody else went through it, it, it went in like in a backwards way to my pain. And it just busted it open. And it was like, oh my gosh, I think I got in touch with like, oh crap, I'm not the only one who's had this pain. And if I'm not all of a sudden this experience of like the, the collective pain for people who have been sexually abused, like it was just like, I just felt it all. And it was, whew, it was, it was like not bearable. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And that resulted in, I assume, um, your first book that you wrote yeah. was kind mm-hmm. of part of that journey. It was. Um, what led you to, what, remind me the name of the book and what led you to write that? So my first book is called The Hidden Gifts Within the Trauma of Sexual Abuse. And I never intended to be an author. Like it never even was like a dream, um, probably because I didn't think it was possible. I had a lot of beliefs around what you needed to be to be an author And, um, I remember I got this mass email from some big blogger who said in the email title, they said, you need to write a book. But when those words ran across my screen, I felt it in my soul. And I was like, what? I'm not going to write a book, 
But then it was like on replay all day, every day, like you need to write a book, you need to write a book. And so I just began to pray as that's my form of really receiving. And I said, fine, if I'm supposed to write a book, show me what the book is. And then one day I was driving down the road and I saw from the top cover to the bottom cover in my mind's eye, these words, the hidden gifts within the trauma of sexual abuse. And I began to ball. It was like full body emotion. And I was like, I am never writing that book. (laughs) And then the book came through my hands and, um, and it's beautiful. And it was a very sacred experience to write that book. Mm -hmm. Had spirituality been something that you were brought up with, or was that something that intersected with your life later on? So I was, I was definitely raised in a very religious family and spirituality was a part of that. I would say my heart has always been spiritual. Um, I was the little girl who was nine sitting on her bed, reading her scriptures, not because anyone told me to, it was just like this craving in my heart. And so spirituality has just always been a part of me. I will say that when I went through my awakening, I had a bit of a break with religion. Um, Like all I knew had to break so I could know for myself who the divine was. And so it's now a little bit more compart- compartmentalized, right? Like it's, they're not meshed anymore for me. Um, so spirituality is a big part of who I am and, and all that I do. Mm-hmm. Was that a Christian faith that you had grown up with mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and p- particular denomination or what was that background like for you? Yeah, I was raised Mormon. So um, beautiful religion, so grateful for it. And also like there was like an expansion in my soul where I had to not be, I, I had to find my own way in, inside of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, what were some of those first like books or resources that you came across that kind of helped you find your own way? Hmm. So I'll tell you the book that broke me <laughs> in such a lovely way, right? Uh, as breaking is actually so lovely. What was it called? It's by Merlin Carruthers is the author. And what is it called? Pr- prison. Hold on. It'll come to me in a second. It'll come to me in a second. I don't even know if Merlin Carruthers has written any other books, but um prison to praise. That's the name. And in my upbringing there, I I don't know if it's actually like a cultural belief or if it was just an internal belief. It's very hard to decide. Was I taught this or did I decide this? Right. But I had this belief that only the leaders of the Mormon religion received from God. And that was just what I believed inside of me. And when I read this book, It was the truest thing I'd ever heard. And it, it was like, oh my gosh, here's this pastor from a different church. And God talked to him and told him this vision that I know is true. And it just was like the thing that broke everything, right? You know, it's like one thing breaks in your faith and then it all just starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And And it was the most beautiful thing that could have happened because now I land in this place where I believe that God speaks to all humans in all places. And, um, and whether or not that was even what was taught in the Mormon religion, I don't even know if that's actually taught. That was just what I believed. And so that book began this search. And then of course, it's just been this array of diving into everything. I love Alana Fairchild's work. It's so beautiful. Do you know her? I do not know. Oh, she's so magical because she, she really has done so much research in all the different religions and then takes all the good stuff and kind of like throws it into a book. And I find, I love all religions. Like I have a real deep love for, for culture and people's beliefs and the magic that lies within each one. So I really love her work. And, um, Wayne Dyer, of course, his work has been really huge in my life. Did you grow up as a reader and a writer or was that, you know, newer for you? 
I did. I was the, I was the little girl who sat on the playground with a book. <laughs> I was always reading. I preferred reading over talking to people. And I was also the teenager who filled rooms full of journals. So I never saw myself as a writer, but I was a writer and I was always writing. And um, so it's just kind of beautiful to now own a publishing house, like my favorite thing, right? <laughs> That's so fun. Yeah, that yeah, is so is. fun. <laughs> so you wrote this first book and... And I know you, you've you written a second book, Rise Up and Awaken to the Joy of Being Human. Did the idea of a publishing house come before the second book or after? So this is, what's, this is one of my favorite stories because I believe that God plants seeds and then they like don't bloom right away. They like have to really nourish in the soil. And that's what this was. When I was creating my first book, I was self-publishing and I saw, you know, I was following this book, like every step of the way. And it said to go start a publishing house so that you would have a legal name to publish under. And when I read that page, I heard loud as day, you need to start a publishing house. And I I mean, this was at the beginning of my business. I didn't even have a coaching program at that time. So it was like, what did, I had like little babies at home at that time, but it was so beautiful because I had the time to meet with lawyers, to meet with trademark lawyers, to set up all the little things that if I had been told today to set up a publishing house, it would have been way harder where at that moment in my life, it was just this beautiful opening in space. And so I actually was shown to start this publishing house years ago and nothing happened. And I would always think, why did I have that inspiration? Was I wrong? Was I hearing things? And I remember about three months before I actually published someone's book, the bank account for my publishing house was down to $14. And I got you know, this bank notice that says it's going to close. And I thought I should just let it close. I don't know why I felt inspired to start a publishing house, but there was a very clear impression that said, put a hundred dollars in and just let it be. So I put a hundred dollars in to hold it open. And about three months later, one of my clients said, I have a book to publish. And I said, oh my gosh, I have a publishing house. <laughs> Let's figure it out. <laughs> and then it's just been this amazing experience ever since. That is awesome. So one of the things that you um, are sharing is this idea that you can write a book in a couple of months. And um, I've written a dozen books and most all of them uh, have not taken much, well, they've taken a little longer than that, <laughs> but not a lot. I, cause I'm a get it done guy. I'm just like, let's get this thing done. Um, so I love this idea. So, um, you even have uh, a free download or a free, uh, that allows people to kind of have a breakdown of this. And we'll definitely point people toward that in the show notes. Um, they can go to kirapolson.com actually and find it, but how is this even possible? Cause most people, when they think about writing a book, they do think about like, this is going to take me at least a year. I don't know why people come up with that. But, like a year comes into their brain <laughs> yeah. and there's so much procrastination and feelings of unworthiness and feelings of like, I don't know what to do. And ironically, self-publishing a book is really easy. Like um, it's not that hard, um, right. but it's, but if you haven't done it before, it can feel insurmountable. It's like, I think yeah. creating a website's easy. Well, I've done that for tons of people. Yeah, That's why you're, you're making it easy for people is kind of taking that off their plate by, you know, helping them. But walk us through, because I love these six steps that you've outlined in how to create, how to write a book in a couple of months. Yeah. Um, maybe before you even do that, like why, why do you even have this belief? Like, why is this important versus no, like, let's just take a year. It should take a year. Make it be painful. Come on. <laughs> well, I love what you're saying. I love that you're bringing up so many points and I'll have to, I'll tell you why I'm so passionate about helping people. So like, really we're self-publishing them with freedom house. We're not, Hey house. We're not going to give people book deals one day. 
one day that'll happen. But at this point, I'm really bringing people through the publishing process. And it's because so many of the women I work with are spiritual leaders. They're really highly gifted. They're shamans, they're healers. They are prophetess of light and technical things shut them down. So what happens is they receive these I like to call them like prophecies, really powerful messages that need to come to the earth. They bring them through and then it gets shut down the second they try and publish because the technical world shuts their brain down. And so what I did is I create a whole done for you publishing system. They come in, they get their own like actual assistant who leads them through every process. They pretty much drop off their manuscript. We take it and I say we midwife it into the world for them. So there's there's reasons of why I really created this to help people not allow the technical realm to shut down their work from entering the world. And why it's so imperative that I believe people write their books quickly is because right now the world is starving for light. And at Freedom House, we help publish books that are of light. They're going to awaken humanity. They're going to heal humanity. And when these messages show up, they're not on the slow plan. These messages come to people like with high speed intensity. And if they think it's going to take them a year, it's going to be painful. And it's actually, it's weird. I don't know if you've experienced this, but if you don't birth the book in the time it needs to come through, it actually does something to your body. It's like a heaviness occurs. Um, everywhere gets a little sticky. Did you ever experience anything like that? Well, uh, I mean, I've also produced and directed four feature films on social justice (laughs) issues. And those take, those take, I, those took me a year from idea to completion. Um, and that's very fast for documentaries or feature films. And, uh, it about killed me. Like it about kills me in that middle part, like the beginning, the end, I'm good. The middle part, part of that's personality, but I get it. Like it's weighty because what you have inside of you needs to get out to the world. And if you don't get it out, it can feel just like, like, I mean, it would be like my wife trying to give birth and like the baby stuck. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Like that sounds horrible, but like- <laughs> No, that's the exact same you, thing. <laughs> you're like you're like an emergency C-section doctor. You just like come in and you're like, I'm gonna cut it out of you. <laughs> it, but it's, that's exactly what I feel. And what I see happen, and I, I watched this with my last book, I, I got, I received a vision in July. And when I say that, I don't want that to sound like lofty. It was a dream that was very real, right? I was, it, it's like, I lived it. It was like a memory. And I, after I had, I woke up, I heard this needs to be a book. And I was like in the middle of COVID. So all five kids were homeschooled, all five kids. And my husband's job at the time had been on halt because of COVID. So I was also the breadwinner. So I'm like homeschooling, running a full-time business. And God's like, and now I'd like you to write a book. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. This is the worst time ever to write a book. And so I said, no. And when I said no, the heaviness on my body was so intense and everything in my life stopped working. And so I really surrendered and said, all right, God, like show me how to write this book. And when I did, it came through with so much quickness and so much ease that not only was it born 30 days later, was it finished, but every area of my life actually expanded. So my business, like three X that month, my children read better in school. My marriage was better. My husband's job started to work. And I was like, oh my gosh, there is magic. When we follow the book, when we follow the inspiration and we bring it through quickly, it does some magical momentum. And so that's why I'm so passionate about helping women birth quickly so that they can feel the magic. It's just pure magic. That's all I can say. So what do you, what do you hear? I feel like I'm not making any sense. Oh, it's great. <laughs> it's great. I mean, I, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. Um, what about people who say, Oh, I just don't like, it's, it's not coming quickly. You know what I mean? Like it's not, maybe they don't consider themselves a writer, but they've got this message, but you know, it's, it feels messy. Like, what do you do for those people who are on the slow birth plan? Yes. Yes. And, and here's, what's so interesting is that the distinction that I make on how I teach women to write their books quickly is that we don't write them. 
we're receiving them. So every tool that I teach is an act of spiritual receiving. It primes their spirit to be in a place of receiving writer's block and not being able to write is because we get stuck in our head and we stop listening from our heart. So I actually believe if you have a message, it needs to come through fast And if you're struggling, it's because the mind is trying to figure it out and you're not receiving it anymore. Okay. First step is sacred space. This is one Mm -hmm. of six steps or six elements. Maybe it's not steps, but six elements. Okay. What is it about a sacred space? So sacred space is one of my favorite topics because it's where I believe we commune with the divine. And when we dedicate a place in our home or on our land, that is for a sacred space, our spirits actually know when we get there that we're going to commune. And, you know, I I look at it like kind of like like what church buildings have done or people have like temples. And it's like, there is like a entrance into a place knowing this is where I'm going to commune with God. But like, what if you had one in your home and it, it doesn't have to be fancy. A lot of people are like, I don't have any room. Like, yeah, I live in a tiny little farmhouse with five kids my sacred space is at the back of my pantry (laughs) and it's sacred because when I go to it, my soul knows that I am there to do spiritual work. And when we can have that every single day, it actually primes our spiritual self to receive easier. Mm -hmm. I've written multiple books in my truck, uh, out, overlooking Newport beach in California. And, uh, I just literally will sit there. I can't afford an office that has an ocean view, but I can get a free (laughs) office for as long as I want just sitting there. Of course, then the meter guy comes by and he's like, your, your, your license plate is not on this printout. I have, I'm like, Oh, Oh, I forgot to put some money in. Hold on. Let me, let me add that. And you literally sit there and just add the money on your cell phone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he goes on and then I just keep right. But I've actually, um, I would get up for a couple of books at 5 a.m. It's still just dark. And I would just go there and park and the sunset would come and then the surfers are going out. And for me, that was one of the places that just felt like um, this is my place to write because if I tried to do it at my desk, I associated my desk with doing things with clients or doing things like work. Yep. You know, yep. but when I was mm-hmm. at my truck, I associate it with, oh, this is a place for me to just be open and ready to receive and write and so forth. So I love this idea of sacred space. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Name the date. What does this mean? So I believe that when you can ask and, and everyone listening, whether it's that they, they connect to source or the divine or God, wherever their higher, the higher self lives, I ask for a date. So I go into prayer and I say, okay, here's the book that I know needs to be written. When's the date it needs to be published. And then I just, sometimes that prayer is like five days long. You don't always hear it right away, but it just a consistent ask. And then a date will show up. And when you hear the date, it now creates the birth. Now we're like, oh, It's coming. And then you have to name it publicly because when you name it publicly, it becomes so. There's so many wiggle room spots where we can be like, well, no one really knows I'm writing this book, so it's fine. But you're like, well, everybody knows it's coming out July 22nd. So now I'm held responsible for showing up and writing the book. Mm -hmm. Because even though we are allowing it to flow through us. Like I have to participate in some way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's um, uh, you may not know, I was actually a pastor for over 10 years. And so wow. um, part of my, part of the education is when you show up to go to school and you learn about the Bible and how it was written, most people that would, well, I would say, most people that are part of the Christian faith would assume that somehow this Bible was magically written through the hands, right? That God mm-hmm. is like m- m- moving the, 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 you know, pen of whatever of each of the disciples. It's like, n- n- no, yeah. like these are letters. Like people actually had to sit down and with volition, write. Now Christians would believe that there's divine inspiration and all this kind of stuff, but right. So it's not like God's going to magically move your fingers on the keyboard. 
you do have to have thoughts. You do have to bring it together. You have to set the time of when you're going to go into the back of your pantry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that, like you have to <laughs> be intentional. There's intentionality yeah. there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Name the date is part of the intention. All right. Alter yes. work. What does this mean? Alter work. So alter work is this, um, it's this thing I made up. <laughs> okay. So I, I have like this amazing creative mind, which means I have a little bit of ADHD in the sense that I have 1 million ideas all the time, which is really a fun way to live. And also it can mean that nothing gets done or amazing things get done. And since I have five children and all these ideas, I, I was asking God, like, how do I manage this? How do I manage running all these businesses and being a stay at home mom where I, you know, cook meals and like take care of my kids. And this idea came to ask every day for one of those ideas. What's one thing I can do for it. What's one thing that I can do towards this idea. And all of a sudden it started to compound all these small little things I was receiving every day. If I took action on one to three of them, I saw massive results. So I use this in writing books is you can put your book on some imaginary altar in your heart or in your mind. And I'm like a physical person. So I actually like cut my hands, like I'm holding the book and I close my eyes and I put it on the altar and I ask, all right, God, what is the first thing that needs to happen for this book today? And then you get to receive, maybe it's, um, you know, the title shows up, or maybe it's just a paragraph comes, but when we can put things on the altar and real surrender of like, what's the thing that needs to happen, it takes this very large idea and puts it into bite-sized actions mm-hmm. it does that are guided. Overwhelming. Say that again. <laughs> that are guided, which is yes. even better. <laughs> yes. Right? It does feel overwhelming for most people when you say write a book, because it's like, how do I start? Where do I, where do I begin? Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying it's the date. Okay. You've got the date, but now how are you asking for the divine's help on a daily basis on what's my next step really is what I'm hearing you say. What's my next step. Yeah. Um, The fourth element you, you write about is spiritually open up to receive from the divine. Mm -hmm. So what is that? I mean, if you're working with spiritual entrepreneurs, they already know what that means to be, to, to open up, Mm -hmm, but like mm -hmm. maybe someone's listening who doesn't necessarily feel like they have that connection, but maybe they've got a book idea, you know, maybe they don't, they've got that book idea, but they're going, I don't know if I really connect that much with source or God that much, but like, so how would I open up to get the divine's help? What would you tell them? So this is something that I teach in my how to write a book course. It's called the creative sacred process. And it's something that I, I don't know, it just kind of came to me because I love, I love smelling oils. Actually, I actually have no sense of smell, which is really interesting, except I can smell. Yeah. I lost it four years ago when I had my awakening. So it's really, I'm sure at some point when I can clear a chakra, I don't know, it'll, it'll activate. Taste food. I can. That's what's so wild. You can taste food, but you have no sense of smell. Right. But I can smell rosemary. Rosemary is the only sense of smell that I have. Okay. So rosemary is like my, it's like a spiritual oil for me. And there's a whole story to that that maybe one day we can talk about, but It is part of this process where if you can have an oil that you smell every time you choose to receive, Um. right? So what my belief is, is that we're training the muscle of your receiver. So like if you go into a gym and your gym clothes, your body's like, I'm ready. I'm at the gym. Like you would never get dressed for a party and show up at the gym. It would feel so off, right? So my belief is if you train your spiritual receptivity, with oils. Like I'm smell rosemary every time I drop in to receive. I also do something I call the prayer of light and I call on my angels. And I do that every time I receive the second I do those actions, my soul actually like it's ready. It's like, I just primed it. So I believe it's not something that just happens, you know, tomorrow, someone listening, isn't going to go, okay. And I'm going to sit down. I'm going to receive my book, but 
Also going to the gym takes a lot of practice to get stronger and stronger. The more you commit to seeking and opening up, it just gets easier and easier. And then the goal is, is at some point you'll have your oil, you'll have your little things that you do and you can drop in anywhere at any time to receive and, and write or do whatever it is that you're feeling inspired to do. What if I'm not a big fan of essential oils, but if I used the smell of fried chicken, like what if fried chicken <laughs> just was like that, that was like my, okay, I've just had my fried chicken. I'm ready to drop in. I don't know. No? <laughs> I'm sure it would probably work. It, it's really okay. just repetition. Right. It's repetition. No, I, hear and you. I hear you. I get it. Focus. <laughs> I like the idea. I don't actually do that. It also could be a candle right? It could be a yeah. candle mm -hmm. that you yeah. light, that it has a certain scent that, uh, cause I love writing with a candle. I don't know. That kind of makes me feel more spiritual or something yeah. like I'm being spiritual right now, but the smell, <laughs> I love it. The smell yeah. does it. That's a, that's genius. I love that. Okay. And then, uh, uh element five is speak to and listen to your book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so let me feel into what I share here. So get, I get some fried chicken for you real quick to you get some fried chicken, but you wouldn't so smell you, it though. I wouldn't smell it. I could see it though. So I, uh, a few years ago, I actually had, um, for about a year, I saw through the veil, which means that I got the experience where a lot of people who had passed were showing up and telling me messages and it was really intense for me. Is this during a time of meditation when you're seeing this? Or just, no, it was just you're all just, the time. It was just all the time. And you're just like, people are like, how do you, like, how would you describe that? Cause that just sounds like super crazy. What you just said. It was there. really intense. It, like no yeah. big deal. Like, I know. Oh, I, just, that, I was trying to think if that's what I shared. I was really trying to figure out how I was supposed to share that, but it, it really, it, it, you'll see why I'm sharing this. So, so what would happen is I would get this feeling like, oh, there's a presence here. And then if I, if I closed my eyes, I could see what they looked like. And then I would hear, and, um, it was really intense. And it was also when I had five, like my children were very little at the time. And so after about a year of it, I was like, I think I can choose to not have this. And so I, I actually prayed and I was like, I need this to be taken away because my physical life is so taxing. It's really intense for me, um, to be receiving messages from the spiritual realm at the same time. So, um, so I share that because when books come, they come like a spirit would show up. It's like a presence arrives. And so when I'm working with someone, I actually can hear like their books will show up to me and like, I can see them, I can feel them. And I'm like, Oh, you have a book that just showed up. And so when that shows up for me. I, I really believe that books have like an essence to them. And if you were to imagine that a book was already written, it was already created and it was coming and tapping on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask it, like, what are you and yes. what do you want to be that the book would collaborate with you? That is good. That is yeah. really good. Wow. That really, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Speak to and listen to your book. So you're speaking to your book. You're listening to your book. Sorry. I'm just taking that in. That's really good. Yeah. That's really powerful. Yeah. You'd stop talking too quickly. <laughs> yeah. That was really good. <laughs> I think I just dropped something pretty intense on y'all, but I, I share that so that so that you can really get how tangible a book is. And those who have felt a book nudge on their heart, then they know it's so tangible. And my belief is that it it's like my children came as they came. Like I didn't decide they were going to have blue eyes and blonde hair. Like they came this way and now I get to figure out how to raise them. And I feel like our books are already written. They just come waiting for us to see them. And to like bring them earthbound mm -hmm. and then they get to go and fulfill the purpose that they were here to fulfill. And the last element that you write about is invite your angels to aid in the writing process. Yeah. So I believe 
This is only my belief. I was not taught this. Like this definitely didn't come from the religion that I was raised in. This is my own personal experience is that we have a spiritual team of angels and guides and leaders and teachers, and they abide by a law of agency, which means that if we don't ask, they don't really get to participate. But if we ask, it's like 10 X in help. And so my spiritual team is my, they're my best teammates. I don't see them. I don't hear them. Like that gift was taken when I asked for it to be taken, but there is a deep belief that they're here because I have seen through the veil and I know that they are. And so what I do is I call them in to the highest order of truth and compassion and the divine light. So really clean. This is who I want to come. And then I ask them for help. Like I ask them to open up space for me to write. That's the biggest piece because there's no possible way for me to write a book and have five kids and run two businesses. It's not possible. So I have to ask angels. I need an hour to write today. I need you to clear it out in some amazing way. And then help me see, help me see that that hour was cleared. And it happens every single time someone will cancel or a neighbor calls and said, Hey, can your kids come over for an hour? Like crazy things happen when you start working with your spiritual team and it just aids in the completion of your book. Mm -hmm. Your husband, does he believe in all this stuff? Like, is he down with all this or does he just like, (laughs) okay, Kira, yeah, whatever you think, like, it's all good. Your book's knocking at the door. Here it is. Like, what is he thinking about all this stuff? (laughs) he's the best. I'm so lucky. I am really lucky to have him because for, he was not, he is not like me at all. We are polar opposites when it comes to this, but he has watched, he's watched, you know, he's watched me do things that most people would never be able to do. And he's watched how the spiritual world has impacted my life. So he's actually pretty on board now. He, he's a big believer of, um, he's in real estate and he does a lot of praying and a lot of spiritual work with his real estate. And we see magnificent results from it. That's awesome. Yeah. Kira Polson.com. It's a, all the different spellings could be possible. So we're just going to have you swipe up on your phone and look <laughs> at the show notes now, or go to our website and, um, You also, as you mentioned, have uh, Freedom House Publishing Co., which people can get your support in publishing their book. And you have a podcast, The Awaken Podcast. How would you describe the podcast? Who should listen to it? Mm, The podcast is just all things fun. It's just all spiritual things. It, It has, sometimes it's just me talking about things that I feel like I've been inspired or guided to share or things that I've learned. And then sometimes I bring on people who have amazing stories of awakening and also spiritual entrepreneurs show up because I love business and I love, I love bringing those two worlds together. And so it's kind of whatever I feel inspired, we bring people on who touch my heart, inspire me, and it will help whoever's listening. Remember that miracles occur and that faith is the strongest muscle they can have. Kira, I like you. You <laughs> are a really amazing person. Um, oh, and I really you. appreciate you sharing about this process. This is great. I mean, I've, uh, I've taken away a couple nuggets here. I love the speak to and listen to your book. That's the number one, one, number one nugget that I'm going to take away uh, today. So mm. um, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. This has been so fun. I, I love having these conversations. They're such joys for me.